Amen. Well, uh, you will have um, read in your communications uh, today that uh, we have not supplied a fresh uh, batch of uh, study notes, and that is simply because we were not able to complete our study last Wednesday night, and so we are simply returning to last week's study, and uh, we will take that through a little bit more tonight, and then, God willing, we will have fresh notes uh, for you next uh, Wednesday night. Uh, <clears throat> so tonight we're going to be looking uh, in particular at verse 10 and verse 11, and then possibly just touching on uh, the rest of the chapter by way of a little outline that will set the pace and the scene for us as we bring uh, Peter's second epistle to a conclusion. We have noted that in these uh, final verses of the final chapter of his second epistle, Peter is focusing upon what has been upon his heart all the way through. Um, he has been concerned about the state of the nation on the one hand and the state of God's people on the other. They are living in a, a time of what he refers to as fiery trials. <coughs> now that uh, little comment describes uh, in some depth uh, what they have been going through. And it's interesting that when he's dealing with the what he perceives to be the end of uh, the testimony and the suffering for the cause of Christ, of the persecuted church, he uses this symbol of fire, fiery trials. Now, when he comes to the final stage of God's controversy with the world, he will use that same term, applying it in a different way, but he describes uh, God's final acts in what is referred to as the day of the Lord in verse 10. He brings in this uh, thought about fire. And, and so that really sets out the emotional depth of these two little epistles. His heart is reaching out to the suffering church. He wants to console them, to comfort them, to encourage them, and to build them up in their faith. Now, sometimes we don't realize that it's often in the adverse circumstances of our lives that we grow the most that even though we may be distracted by other things, often it is the struggle to maintain our faith and to walk with God that builds us up in our faith and helps us to overcome the challenges that are brought against it. Now, we have looked in this third chapter of Second Peter at uh, the... Uh, influence that has crept into the church and is seeking to undermine the, uh, the very cause of uh, the gospel. And it's set out in the first verse of chapter 2 under the umbrella of what Peter refers to as false prophets and false teachers. So what he is um, reminding us of here, of course, is that in the historical setting of the church, go back into the Old Testament, and, and we brought this out on last Sunday morning in our morning worship, how that even among the prophets, there was a turning away from the principles that had governed the lives of the people of God uh, right down through the history 
of God and his people Israel. You may remember how on a number of occasions uh, they were told uh, from God himself, be holy for I am holy. That was um, a, an established reality and the very laws themselves governed that knowledge and uh, ensured that the children of Israel uh, obeyed them in order to uh, pursue holiness, which James tells us in the New Testament, without which we will not see the Lord. And Jesus himself told us in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that is the goal of every believer, not just seeing God in conversion, but seeing God in our daily lives. And the only way that we can do that is by living a holy life. But sadly, uh, many of the prophets of old were not true prophets. They were false prophets. And you will often see the true prophets uh, setting out, exposing, and uh, recording for the children of Israel just how far short of the holiness of God these false prophets had come. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, he refers to the false prophets among the people. And then he brings it right up into the present scene and describes them as false teachers among you. <clears throat> now, prophets, and, and I say this carefully and cautiously, but prophets have their setting in the Old Testament. Teachers have their setting in the New Testament. <clears throat> and uh, that comes out very clearly when you look at the gifts that God has given to the church as outlined by Paul in Romans and in Corinthians, etc. So now Peter is, uh, is telling us that just as truth is not new, neither is untruth neither is false teaching, as in the expo exposure of these false uh, prophets. So just as uh, the prophets in the Old Testament had to contend with the false prophets who sought to spread false information and lead the people astray all through the history of the Old Testament, <clears throat> So the apostles in the New Testament have to maintain that very close and very rigid concentration on maintaining the truth among the New Testament churches because it is difficult to build up a church but easy to pull it down. And so the, the instructions of Scripture often are that we have a very, very close watch over not just the church at large, but over our own individual lives. Because that is how, that is how Satan attacks the church, brick by brick, or living stone by living stone. If he can weaken or remove the bricks, then the whole building loses its integrity. And that is the concern of, uh, of Peter. Now, there are two ways that we can confront or control wrong teaching. One is 
that we attack it head on. We expose it, we condemn it, and uh, we, in that sense, we get rid of it from its environment within the body of Christ, within the church of Christ. And Peter will do that when he opens up this third chapter to us. But the other way that we counteract this false teaching is by building up the truth. That is, we instruct uh, God's people in righteousness, in the Word, and the more we understand the Scriptures, the more we grow in the Word, and the Word grows in us, then the less inclined we are to be disturbed by the false teachers. We will know error when we hear it or when we see it, and thereby we are able uh, to counteract that false teaching. So here is how Peter then brings in this, uh, this thought. Verse 1 of chapter 3, I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So you'll see the thought here of purity, of holiness, and uh, he links that with uh, good, sound, solid teaching. I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So you have been you have been grounded in the Word. Don't let any new doctrine interrupt or interfere with that Word. And then he goes on to add that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. So, back up in verse 1 of chapter 2, we read of the false prophets. But here in verse 2 of chapter 3, we read of the holy prophets. So, there is the contrast. We are either grounded by the teaching of the holy prophets, or we become insecure by the teaching of the false prophets. And that will always be the challenge of the Christian church. That's why we need to safeguard, we need to value the Word, and we need to safeguard the Word by insisting that we do not stray from the teaching of uh, the Gospel. So very quickly, then, we come down into this, um, this uh, raising of the, uh, the problem in that sense that is relevant to the writing of this epistle and uh, to this people. Knowing this first, verse 3, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And there in those few little verses, we have the entire Bible, right from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. It's all contained just in that one broad statement. 
and how is it all revealed and uh, how is it all set out? Well, there is the answer in verse 7. By the same word. It's all there in the word of God. So how are we anchored in the faith? By the word of God. Where do we find our confidence, our hope? In the word of God. False teachers won't give you that. So then Peter goes on. Verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some kind slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So that's uh, Peter's answer to the false teaching and to uh, the motivations and the perceived outcomes of this element of negative faith within uh, the churches. So we're going to just return to that little statement in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And last study, we focused upon the question, how will uh, Christ come? How will the day of the Lord be ushered in? And uh, we went through a number of scriptures confirming that he will come as a thief in the night. And um, the thought that Paul gives us in 1 Thessalonians 5 uh, and in verse 3 is that he will come when we are in relative peace and safety. So that simply means that we're not expecting a visit from the vandal of uh, evil and it comes under cloak of secrecy. He will come as a thief in the night. Now, the other question that um, goes with that is, um, when will he come? And I know that you all know uh, many references that bring out that uh, fascinating fact, so we won't go into that at this point, but uh, just to, to uh, again outline the fact that the, the overall uh, thought that brings all of those references that I've listed in your study notes together is to explain to us that the thief will come when we least expect it. That's the common denominator that runs right throughout those scriptures. Luke 12, Matthew 25, 24, uh, Mark 15, uh, 13, and so on. All explain that in an hour that you think not the Son of Man comes. That is how a thief comes. So that's very clearly set out in scriptures. So. We don't know when it will happen. We do know to an extent how it will happen, at least the day of the Lord. It will come, we're told, as a thief in the night. So at any time, at any moment, without any warning, without any advanced indications, the day of the Lord will come. Now, as we pursue this thought, we do get a little insight 
into the signs that we can read which will compel us to consider that the coming of Jesus draws near. And you will see that set out in two verses, uh, verse 10 and verse 12. So let's just put those together for a moment. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now, there are three things that are set out here very clearly and very distinctly. We have the heavens, we have the elements, and we have the earth. So all of these are going to be involved. In fact, they are going to be the centerpiece of the coming day of the Lord. So how will they figure? How will they dominate this, uh, this scene? Well, let, let's go back up into, um, into verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Now, the difference between the heavens and the earth is simply in that. The heavens are plural. The earth is singular. There are three heavens and only one earth. So, we are being specific in the outline of this. Peter is telling us exactly what is going to happen to the created heavens and to the created earth. So we don't need to worry about nuclear energy. You probably heard the news. It's all full of nuclear energy today. We don't have to worry about, about any of these things because God has it all under his control and within his authority. But what does this mean? Look at verse 10. We're told, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. A better translation of that would read, the heavens will disappear with a roar. Uh, just let that sink in for a little minute and uh, I'll make a suggestion that will bring a, an interesting link. The heavens will disappear with a roar. We, we consider, if, if, if I tell you that poor so-and-so has passed <coughs> away, What's your immediate response to that? They have died. Here we're told the heavens will pass away. They're no more. They are gone. But how did they pass away? The heavens will disappear or pass away with a great noise. What is that great noise? Literally, with a roar. Now, let's step back a little bit from that and remember what the devil is like at the moment, knowing that he has but a short time. He goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
What does that word devour mean? It means pass away or die or be destroyed. That's the intent of the devil. But how will Jesus return? He will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what does the lion do? The lion roars. So when the day of the Lord comes and the heavens pass away, they will pass away with a roar. I could ask, who has the last laugh? He who laughs last laughs longer. You've heard that. Well, here is just that little insight into the irony of the devil's mischievous works. He tries to counterfeit God, but God will always have the last and final word. And, and this, this is the thought that Peter is building up in uh, this, uh, this passage. The other thought is if you go over to Revelation chapter 6 and, um, and look in verse 14. Look at, uh, look at how this is uh, described. Uh, just down into, uh, I'll read verse 12 as you're turning. To, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Now here is the, the, the verse. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So here are the heavens passing away with a great noise. And here is the interesting thought. We read here, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now the thought here is a little bit, maybe not so much like the rolling up of a scroll, but have you ever operated a blind on the window? And you've gone you've gone to either uh, to do adjust it, either put it up or to put it down. And somehow your hand has slipped. And the next thing, <laughs> up goes the blind and it crashes to the top. That's, that's the, the, the strength of this, uh, this thought. It's not just a, a gentle rolling up of a scroll, but it's the flipping up, as it were, in an instant. Of, of that recoiling blind. So there we have it. Then the sky receded as a scroll wind is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So here is the thought. As the sky or the heavens pass away, it will be accompanied by the crackling sound of a roaring fire. Now, let me just explain that this way. Many years ago now, we were ministering in a church up in Queensland, not far from uh, where you come from, Steve. Uh, we were just under the foot of, of the, the, as you go down into the city, Brisbane. We were in um, Ipswich, uh, the suburb of Raceview. And back then, I was a lot younger and much more energetic. 
maybe not better looking, but I was, um, I was at that stage able to hop in the car and drive down from there to Sydney for any meetings that we had down here. And we would do that in a day. Back then, you sort of averaged about 11 to 12 hours drive. That was before all the bypasses and all the new roads and all of that. Uh, and so it was quite a journey. But we had a family friend who also went into the ministry in the UK. And uh, he had come out to spend a little time with us here and to learn a little about the work here in Australia. And we were traveling down for some meetings here in Sydney. And uh, we had to drive down through the cane fields. And we had never seen or heard this before. So we were as excited as he was. But long before we got close, we could see the glow in the distance. Obviously, something was on fire. And it took us possibly half an hour, maybe, maybe longer, to actually get to where the action was happening. But as we got closer, the sound of crackling and popping and all that became more and more and more intense until eventually we got to where the fire was and it turned out to be the cane fields where they were burning the cane uh, before harvesting it. And that was, that was to kill any vermin or whatever that might be in, the, in, in among it uh, and, and to burn off a lot of the undergrowth and all of that. But we, we actually pulled in and we got out and we stood and we just watched and listened to this awesome sound of this burning cane. Well, that's the kind of thought that's in that, uh, that reference. The heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So here is the thought. The heavens and the earth will pass away. Now, before we get too involved in that, just take a little look down at verse 13. This is in 2 Peter chapter 3. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens. So note again the plural. So we're not replacing heavens with heaven, but the heavens will be replaced with heavens. And then a new earth. So the thought here is that before we can have new heavens and a new earth, the old heavens and the old earth have to pass away. And what does God say? The heavens and the earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. So anything and everything that would contradict or seek to counterfeit the work of God will perish. But God will not deviate from his plan or from his purpose. Now, the second thing very quickly is uh, the uh, elements. Now, what, what do we know by the elements? Come over into Isaiah, Isaiah, and chapter 34. Isaiah chapter 34. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their host shall fall down, 
as the leaf falls from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. What are the elements? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Now time has gone, so we won't look these up, but consult your study notes, and you will see that Joel, Matthew, Mark, and John in the book of Revelation will give you other references that line up with this uh, concept here. And here is the, um, the interesting thought. What is to happen to the elements when the day of the Lord comes will be a reversal of the whole account of creation. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and read verse 14 through to 18, uh, or go into Psalm 8 and uh, read there in verse uh, 3 where uh, David is asking, what is man that you're mindful of him? You will see in the context of all of that uh, the story of creation. And then the last thought is... Uh, the earth, and we're simply told the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And uh, the, the literal for that word burned up is laid bare. Now, again, just bring that thought uh, into focus. Laid bare. What does this remind us of? the judgment of God, when the heart will be laid bare before God. That is one of the indicators of the day of the Lord, as spoken by Peter. But I want to, um, I want to just finish off with this little thought, and we, we go back into the book of Isaiah for this, and we look at a few references. And I think that this is, uh, this is very important for us. We'll start off in chapter 13. You've all heard the threatening of some of the major leaders globally threatening um, the use of atomic weapons in the countless conflicts that are rising up all over the world. And uh, we hear it on a regular basis, this fear that someone who is not in a proper frame of mind or under some delusionary evil influence could press the button and we could be cast into the nightmare of um, atomic doom, or now we're talking nuclear uh, power, nuclear warheads, and so on. And the question is, who or what will it take for someone to press the button? That, that's the fear of the world. Well, let's just look at a few verses as we close, and we'll ask that question. Who will press the button that will bring it all to an end? Let's go to Isaiah 13, and uh, we'll begin at verse 9. But we read here, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Now, Peter puts it this way, the day of the Lord will come. But here is Isaiah, and he's before Peter. And Isaiah's approach is, we need to be ready because the day of the Lord comes. That means it's already set. It's already coming. So every day that we live brings us one day closer to the coming of the day 
of the Lord. So here is what he tells us. Cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Now over to chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 18. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the fountains of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. And then over to chapter 34. Verse 1, Come near, you nations, to hear and heed, you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falls from the vine, and as fruit falling from a fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bosra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust saturated with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its stream shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. And we could read on, but here is the day of the Lord. Who will press the button? It will be God. He will bring it all to an end. In this context, Peter goes on to bring us two main themes. Verse 11 and 12, he brings a challenge. In verse 13, 
He brings a comfort. And in verse 14, he brings an assurance. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. And again, that's an interesting comment. Looking forward. We often refer to that as uh, anticipating something good that's approaching us in the future. We're looking forward to it. Philosophically and logically, we have to look forward to it. If it's ahead of us, we can't look back to it. It's not, not here yet. So we look forward to it. But there's also that sense of anticipation, that sense of excitement that thrill of knowing when it happens. It is going to be the most beautiful uh, and grand experience that we have enjoyed. So that's the thought that Peter has here. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. But how can we look forward to the heavens being rolled up like a scroll and and having this unbearable noise as everything burns up and melts with fervent heat. How can we look forward to that? Well, we can because it's not man's day. It's not Satan's day. It's the day of the Lord. And he is working out his purposes for us. So therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him, worried, anxious, no, in peace. That only comes when we rest our confidence in him, without spot and blameless. That's holiness of character and of life. The world around us is getting worse. We ought to be getting better. The differences ought to be more clear and more clearly defined. We ought to be living as God intends us to live so that when the day of the Lord comes, we will be found in him. Amen. We will, God willing, return to uh, these final verses next uh, Wednesday night. Let's have a little prayer. Loving Father, we do continue to rest in your promises tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its clarity and power, for its energy within our lives for your word is a living word. It's vibrant. It's vital. And it not only preserves us, but it motivates us to live the way you want us to live in this present time in which we live. The days are... Uh, growing shorter and passing more swiftly. And we have that deep sense in our heart that the coming of Jesus draws near. We pray that you will keep us faithful, keep us focused, and keep us vital to the work of the kingdom as we surrender our hearts and lives unto you. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.